Welcome to this lesson on My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. This may be, I'm warning you in advance, it may be quite a long lesson because there's a ton to say about this poem. And I remember actually studying this poem at GCSE and I loved it. I think I actually did my exam on it in the end. But um, it's hard to get your head around at first. It takes a while. When you actually click with it, you probably, like me, will find it really, really fun. So when I first read it, I was like, what on earth is he on about? And then the second or third time round, when I started studying it, it really made sense to me. And it was actually quite, it's quite engaging and entertaining in the way that watching like a thriller or a crime documentary might be. It's kind of engaging and like, you know, the way that maybe watching a horror movie might be. There's all these sort of genres that you can see it relating to. And maybe you're not into those genres, in which case you want to just kind of try and think about it from a more historical perspective or a more kind of psychological perspective, maybe. But if you are into those things, this is sort of like the Victorian equivalent of, um, you know, a Netflix show on, on crime, on like murders and serial killers or that type of thing. So if you think of it that way, it makes it a bit more alive for you, a bit more engaging and interesting. And if you also bear with me, hopefully by the end of this lesson, you're going to be really confident on analysing it. Because if you do get this in an exam, it's a super interesting and deep poem to be able to analyse. And you'll probably quite enjoy it by the time you get there. So the first thing to do with any poem is to read it aloud. I would like you to pause me and read it aloud now for yourself. So have it have it up on a you know a separate tab or... Um, it's a bit too long for me to put kind of in this video all in one go. And um, yeah, have it printed in front of you maybe, have it in a book. And uh, read it aloud to yourself. It's a little bit difficult, so you might struggle over some of the words, you might not quite get what's going on. The best advice I can give you is to make sure that you kind of notice where the full stops are and try and read according to the full stops. So ignore the end of the sentence, ignore the end of the line and just read as if it was sentences. And that should give you a bit more clarity. And that's the kind of tip that you can use for any poem as well. So I'll just read a few lines of it just to show you um, as an example how that would go. That's my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands work busily a day and there she stands. Will it please you sit and look at her? I said for our Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there. So, not the first of you to turn and ask thus. So, that comes from me reading this poem a lot over several years, obviously I knew it quite well. But try and emulate that type of reading in your own when you're reading it aloud. And read it through several times before and after this lesson, and it will kind of click with you each time that you read it. So pause me now, have a read through of the poem. Good luck, <laughs> hope it goes well. And um, if you're really stuck, look up a you know a recording of it by someone else. When you're ready, we'll come back to the lesson and I'll go through some core vocab with you. So we've got quite a bit of vocab here, mainly because it's in this kind of Victorian style, but also this mock medieval style. So some of the phrases are very kind of medieval sounding because it's set in the medieval era. And some of them are very Victorian sounding because it's written in the Victorian era. It's kind of like if someone wrote a story or a poem nowadays, but they set it maybe 400 years ago. So like Shakespeare's time, that kind of thing. So, yeah, you can imagine how it might sound a bit modern, but it might also try and copy the language of that time. So countenance, first of all, really Victorian word. It means face or facial expression. If they durst is a bit more old fashioned. That means if they dare. Mantle is a medieval robe. It's kind of like something with really big sleeves. If you picture, if you think about pictures of medieval 
people <laughs> that you've seen, like in a painting or something. They wear um, mantles. So you can Google image search that as well if you're not sure about what I mean there. It's always good to do Google image searches just to like reinforce your knowledge of something because then you can picture it so much more clearly and it just makes a lot more sense to you. So don't always just like sit there with the poem and think, what on earth does it mean? Go away, Google stuff, kind of absorb ideas and listen to me, obviously. And um, you'll, yeah, you'll feel a lot more at home with the poem. Uh, courtesy means politeness. Kind of comes from the same word as curtsy, I think, where you like bow. Um, but it means kind of Obeying, obeying rules and being polite in an old-fashioned sense it means curtsy like where you you bow you kind of um sort of do it to show politeness that act of curtsying a bow is a thick tree branch officious is someone who's confrontational and maybe trying to be dominant or authoritative but maybe they're not kind of worthy of that. They're like challenging, basically. Mule is kind of a donkey. Technically, it's like half horse, half donkey, but basically it just means donkey. Stoop, which is a word that's repeated a lot. If you stoop down, it means you bend low. So you're kind of bending down. Trifling, if something's a trifle, it means it's not very important or serious. Wits. Um, there's a phrase to have your wits about you and it means to kind of be intelligent or kind of have your mind sort of switched on. Intellectual engagement, kind of clear mindset, that type of thing. Munificence, this one means generosity. If you're a munificent person, you give a lot of money away. Like you're kind and you're generous with what you own. Like you don't keep it all for yourself. Pretense comes from the same word as like pretend or pretension or pretentious. So it's kind of like a fake reason reason for doing something. A vow just means to admit or promise. A rarity is something that's very rare. You can kind of guess that from the meaning. And dowry, finally, some of you may know if you've studied other literature, what a dowry is. But it's basically, um, in more traditional settings, the wife's family had to pay the husband for the marriage, essentially. like They kind of gave a payment to the husband. So a dowry is um, when you get married, the, the husband see, receives some fam... Uh, bleh, sorry. <laughs> when you get married, the husband receives some money from the family for your upkeep like, to look after you. Nowadays... In some cultures, they do still have diary, dowry. I, can't, I don't know what's going on with my voice with this one. I can't say it. But you know what I mean. They have dowries in some modern cultures as well. But traditionally, it was a lot more common. So, we'll have a look at the story then. It's reasonably long, my explanation of the story. But bear with me, because it's, it's important that you know kind of exactly the detail of how it goes. The character of the Duke is a super detail-oriented person, so there's a lot to take in at first, which is why I say it's one of those poems that you want to spend a bit longer on and uh, make sure that you kind of pick up on that detail and, and understand it fully. So firstly, we're looking at the portrait of the last Duchess that is painted and hanging on the wall. The Duke, who is the... So Duchess and Duke are kind of like... Um, royal titles so they they're kind of aristocrats in this land they're sort of high up rich families um so the the duchess has died and the duke basically says she looks like she's alive so that's how we know she's actually not alive anymore he says it's an amazing painting a wonder and this painter is called Fra Pandolf. Fra just means like brother. So it's like an old fashioned word for monk, like the fact that he was a religious guy. But Fra Pandolf worked on it really hard for a day and now it's been finished. So he's kind of name dropping Fra Pandolf there saying this is like a really famous painter and he's painted this thing and it's amazing. So the Duke is speaking to an envoy, a messenger from his new wife to these family. And he wants the envoy, the messenger, to sit and have a look at the painting. 
so automatically we have this dominance established like the the messenger is just kind of a lower class servant of the wife's family of the wife to be's family he doesn't have any power and the duke is um all powerful and he's in his space his kind of private art collection so he holds all of the power and he's got kind of dominance over the envoy the duke says he called it Fra Pandolf because some strangers look at it and they start to question the depth and passion of how the woman looks. Like, why does she look so intensely alive and realistic? And it's sort of suggestive that, like, maybe she had a relationship with the painter or there's something kind of unusual about her. But also it's a bit kind of slightly jealous, like, undertone going on there. And he says, well, you know, my justification is like, it's just one of the best painters in the world did it. So that's why she looks so great. So he's kind of dismissive of that suggestion. So the Duke says that these strangers, these people that ask, why is the painting so realistic? They turn to him for answers because he's the only one that can show this painting. So he's like, oh, I have this mysterious, beautiful painting, probably one of the best paintings in the world. And these people come and ask me questions about it. And we realise that the, the messenger is also asked about her expression. So maybe he was just being polite or trying to find something to say, but the Duke interprets this because he's a narcissistic character. He's obsessive and thinks he's brilliant. And he interprets this as like, oh, you know, you're, you're wowed by this painting as well. Everyone's wowed by it. It's brilliant. It costs me loads of money and it's by the most famous painter ever. So that's the kind of attitude he has. So he says, well, it wasn't just her husband, so it wasn't just me that made her look like that. And then he goes through like all the different parts of her that look attractive in the painting. So her cheek and how it's blushing, which can be a sign of um, shyness and modesty, but it could also show like kind of a flushed expression. Her wrists, her throat, throat is kind of sinister there. He says that it was she was too easily pleased by other people's attentions and she just liked everything and she's interested in everything. So he's sort of suggesting he sh she should have only been interested in him, like he wanted her full attention and she didn't give that. He says that all of the different types of attention were just the same to her. So whatever he told her, um, when the daylight kind of set, if a man gave her a gift, riding her white horse around the castle grounds, all of these things made her react in the same way. She was just like really excited and happy by all of these things. And he says it was fine for her to be grateful to other men, but he was annoyed that she treated them the same way she treated him, as if his gift of an ancient aristocratic name was only as good as their gifts. So this is quite important because he's comparing the fact that he is a duke and he is so rich and he has this very strong um, family bloodline. And by marrying him, the duchess gets to kind of be part of all of that and her children will have that same name and so on. So to him, that's a very big deal. But to her, she's just treating that the same as like, you know, how nice it is for her to ride around on her horse or if someone else gives her some cherries. She has the same reaction, the same positive kind of happiness. So it makes him jealous and it makes him question her. The Duke says, even if he was skilled at talking, it wouldn't be worth speaking his mind to her and explaining how he felt. Because if he, if she, if he'd done this and she'd listened, if he would have been stooping, he would have lowered himself to her level. He thinks she misbehaved and was out of order and he didn't want to drag himself down to her level which is where the stooping idea comes in she smiled when he passed her but she also smiled at everyone he gave orders and the smile stopped and this is a euphemism this is something that he's kind of secretive about so it suggests that he actually ordered her to be killed but it's not it's not obvious enough that you can pinpoint him as a murderer so finally, the poem switches back to focusing on this painting. And we've gone from like, oh, that's a nice painting. I wonder how, <laughs> you know, how lovely it is or like how this woman was to like a really kind of dark story that gets more and more jealous and kind of 
scary and frightening and eventually sort of suggest that this duke is a murderer. And then it just switches back to a light-hearted tone and the duke's like, okay, you need to go down now and leave. And, you know, the count is downstairs, so your master is downstairs and we're sorting out the diary for this new duchess. So obviously this old duchess has died and then he's remarrying this new duchess and he's speaking to the messenger from that duchess's family. And the final image we see is where he talks about, look at this sculpture that I have as well in my gallery, Neptune taming a seahorse, which is symbolic. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. So hopefully my explanation of that story makes it kind of clearer to you. I've tried to be as accurate to the specific language as possible so that you can map what I've given you as a story on top of what's there already um, in the poem so that you can see kind of section by section how it works even though it's one stanza it's clearly in sections so if you go to the scribbly website there's um you know you can if you're part of that course you can download this resource and kind of have a look through it but if you're watching this on a different platform just kind of go back over and maybe screenshot the story and um, I'll just actually scroll so that you can do that. So yeah, this is the first section of the story. And then um, that's the sec second section. So yeah, just in case you wanted to screenshot that. So we're going to move on to some of the detail now in the poem. And hopefully you're kind of feeling confident on the basic shape of how it goes. And I've tried to give you some of the deeper ideas as well already. So firstly, the speaker is the Duke. This is important. We see it from his point of view. We know he's been married at least once before and his wife died and he sort of subtly suggests that he killed her. It's not obvious and it's important that it's not like, he's not like obviously boasting. He's just kind of secretly suggesting. So he's kind of a sinister, manipulative character. Um, this is why I say it's like similar to kind of serial killers nowadays or if you're interested in like psychology and criminology, um, those types of things are present in this poem. So we start by kind of maybe empathizing with him. We might think, you know, fair enough, he's upset by the wife's death, or maybe he's upset that she didn't give him enough attention. But by the end, we're all 100% sure he's not a nice person. We're quite sure that he killed her. And we switch from sympathy to shock and disgust. And that's a really important shape to uh, our emotions. So his tone is really cold and practical and superior. Tone is a really important thing to talk about in essays. So make sure you're always confident with tone when you're doing your literature. He's got this kind of abstract way of speaking, like he just sees things in quite a practical point of view and he's very cold and controlling. In modern terms, we might think of him, like I said before, as a narcissist, someone who's really self-obsessed and can only see things from their point of view. We might think of him as a sociopath, someone who doesn't have enough kind of social skills to, um, to empathize and feel sorry for or understand other people's positions. Or we might think of him as a psychopath, which is someone who's kind of like a sociopath, but violent along with it. I think of him personally as probably psychopathic, but also narcissistic. So yeah, if you're interested in psychology, again, go look at the difference between those. Um, yeah, look them up, kind of read about them and then decide for yourself, what is he, this guy? So he's kind of, in a way, threatening the envoy in a very manipulative, roundabout way. We realize that, you know, he's kind of telling this as a warning to the messenger because he's like, well, you know, we're about to get married, this new, me and this new duchess, but obviously this is what happened to the other one, so she best not be like this, basically. So it's quite scary if you see it that way, because you're like, oh, he, you know, he's just like talking about his painting, but then it becomes a message, like a secret kind of hidden message, like, you know, I've killed one, I'm not going to feel bad about killing her kind of thing if that makes sense at all. I'm kind of not explaining it properly, but hopefully you get what I mean. The other voices are silent, and this is the most important thing about the speaker voice in this poem. We don't really hear what the envoy says. He listens most of the time. We know that he asks some questions, but we don't know what he asks. 
we assume he's responding to the Duke, but the Duke dominates the conversation because it's in the form of a dramatic monologue, which we'll look at in a second. Um, we see it all from his point of view, not from an equal perspective. So language points then, I have a lot of them. I'm gonna whiz through them quite quickly, but again, feel free to pause and read my full analysis if you feel like it's useful. The main reason I'm whizzing through is to make sure that the lesson's like not crazy long for you and you're just like, what's going on? <laughs> so yeah, it's a kindness on my part. But there's a lot of techniques here that are quite interesting. So he asks rhetorical questions to the envoy. They're rhetorical because the, the envoy doesn't really need to answer. So like he's kind of commanding him through these questions. So it seems like he's being polite and, you know, asking him things, but underneath that, he's actually being quite serious and demanding. So because of the difference in the social position of the two, the envoy doesn't really have the option to say no or, um, you know, disagree with him. So the questions are kind of pointless, they're rhetorical. There's foreshadowing, which if you read the poem more than once, you'll notice those little references to the death of the Duchess early on and the possible murder and so on. Like he's kind of secretly hiding those sneaky little messages in there. Like he tells the envoy to notice the half flesh that dies along her throat. There's a lot of repetition, which we could say shows his obsessiveness, his kind of like fixation on control. He's a bit of a control freak and he's very, um, yeah, particular and specific about how things should be done. So when something annoys him, he repeats it. So he repeats stoop, he repeats spot of joy, and he repeats frappandoff. I think he's not annoyed by frappandoff, it's more like impressed by the fact that he has this famous painter's thing in his house. The similes looking as if she were alive, they're really unsettling, because like she, she was alive. And he's like, oh, she looks as if she were alive there. So it's kind of unsettling and creepy. He uses a range of pronouns. So first of all, third person pronoun. We never know the Duchess's name, only her title. She's judged just by her, um, the fact that she's a Duchess, like her status in life. He uses the possessive pronoun my a lot to show that things belong to him and he's obsessive about what he owns or possesses, including the Duchess herself. And that's part of the title as well. So do analyze that if you're gonna use that one. He uses the symbol, as we were talking before, or metaphor you can call it, of Neptune taming a seahorse. So Neptune's a god of um, the sea. He's a very powerful being who's normally depicted with a trident, like quite a violent um, sort of pronged stick. <laughs> Look up what a trident is if you don't know. If I'm not explaining it very well. But yeah, taming a seahorse. So a seahorse is like beautiful and delicate and fragile and small. And Neptune's this huge, all-powerful being. And it's kind of suggested that this is how he sees himself versus his wife or his wives. He sees them as kind of fragile things that he can control and himself is all-powerful. There's some Middle English phrasing, I've repeated simile here, so I'm gonna just take that out. <laughs> some Middle English phrasing, so Middle English is that medieval language um, that gives it that authentic feeling that it is from that time period. And finally, synecdoche, which is quite a hard technique to um, talk about. So if you're gonna use that one, just Google it and make sure you're confident with it first before you use it in an essay. So, Quite a few language points there. There are loads more as well because um, Browning's just like a genius writer and he writes like a ridiculous amount of techniques into each of his poems. So feel free to kind of go deeper and find more. But this is a good starting point if you're, yeah, if you have any, if you want some ideas for your essays. So we're going to do the same with structure and form. There's a cyclical structure. It starts and ends in a similar way. Will it please you to look at her? Will it please you to rise? So come over here, go away now. And then here's a picture of my Duchess. This is what happened to her. I'm gonna go marry my new Duchess. So there's all these cycles, these commands from the Duke, these repetition of like marriage. 
So everything is kind of circling and we wonder if the new Duchess is going to suffer the same fate. She's definitely in danger when she marries this Duke. But they're signing the diary at that moment, so it's really dramatic. Like, you, there's nothing you can do at this point. They're going to be married. There's quite a few different pieces of punctuation. Um, the main one that I really like, that I actually remember using myself in essays. This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. Sejura, those semicolons. It gives some pauses there. This grew, I gave commands then all smiles stop together. There's these dramatic pauses and it creates more tension and it kind of winds us up because we want to know what happened. It also gives a moment of reflection while the Duke is actually like thinking about how do I phrase this so that I don't give away that I killed her but I also suggest that I might have. So it sort of shows his cleverness and his calculated nature that he's got these frightening dramatic pauses where he's reflecting on his exact choice of words. It also signifies what we call a volta, which is a shift in tone. So before this point it's kind of been like, okay well we're looking at a painting. After this we're like, whoa we're looking at a psychopath, <laughs> we're not looking at a painting, it's not about that, it's about how crazy he is, this guy. So there's a massive shift in our experience uh, you know, expectation of the story and our impressions of what's going on. Everything is one long single stanza and that's because it's a dramatic monologue. So when you want to analyse the form, analyse it along the lines of a dramatic monologue. That means that it feels like it's a speech in a play and it's a speech from the point of view of a character. So it's very important with this one, as you hopefully have guessed by now, that the Duke is nothing like the writer. The poet is not a murderer and he's not crazy. He's quite crazy, but he's not like a, you know, bad, evil crazy. So the speaker is the Duke. He's a character and he's speaking in character. So we see everything from his point of view, but he is not a bad, uh, sorry, the poet is not a bad person. Really important to make sure that you make that distinction. Finally, we can say that it starts in medias res, which means in the middle of things, like we're just plonked into this world. There's no like build up of setting and you know what's going on. It's just like right in the middle, here we are, here's these characters, here's what's going on. So yeah, hopefully that's all kind of clear for you. Feel free, like I say, to pause and go through in more detail if you need. So a couple of things to finish off then with this one. With the context, it's set in 1561, during the Renaissance period. Um, this is kind of like a little bit of time before Shakespeare. Maybe as Shakespeare's is starting to be around at this time, if you want to kind of think about it time period wise. But it's in Italy. So Ferrara is a place in Italy. The narrator is based on a real person, Duke Alfonso II of Ferrara whose wife, was a young wife, Lucrezia Medici, died under suspicious circumstances, suspected poisoning. She's married at 14 and dead by 17. And he married again three times after, uh, sorry, three times in total. So if the next Duchess is like the one after this Lucrezia, she is also going to die as well if you look at the history of what happened. So it's really influenced by an actual historical um, story about a historical real figure, which makes it, in my opinion, a lot more frightening because it's not just like, oh, but it's only a character. It's like, this is a real crazy person. Browning was really interested in the Renaissance, the medieval period. He lived in Florence in Italy. Florence is a beautiful place. You can go see his house. You can even stay at his house. So last year, because I'm such a nerd, I went to the Browning's house, Browning, Robert Browning and, and um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, like their kind of place that they lived in Italy where they wrote all their poems and stuff. And you can sleep there and, um, you know, hang out and read books from their library. And if you're a total nerd, it's really fun. And even if you're not, it's actually quite a cool place to visit and it's free to do so. So if you go to Florence, I really recommend just, you know, spending an hour there or something. But they were really obsessed, him and his wife, who was also a poet, obsessed with the medieval period. They were obsessed with Italy. They ran away 
from Victorian life um, to go live in Italy. They're really cute stories, so read about their story and how they got together if you're interested in the Brownings, because it's just it's really adorable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they, they uh, lived there. So he's experienced directly what it is like to be in Italian culture and how it feels to live in Italy, and he's obviously interested in that kind of history. So it's not just like talking about Italy from the point of view of someone who lives in England. Um, Fra Pandolf, I've kind of like gone through him already, a fictional painter but based on real Renaissance painters, so a lot of them are called Fra. The, my favourite Fra painter is Fra Lippo Lippi, um, who's in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. So again, if you go to Florence or just Google him and how he looks, he's he's a really cool painter. So I personally, when he talks about this Fra Pandolf, I kind of think he's talking about Fra Lippo Lippi in my head. Um, and finally, so Robert Browning is a Victorian poet talking about a medieval Renaissance time, but he's also a Victorian poet living in Italy, talking about Italian attitudes versus Victorian attitudes and mourning, which is where you commemorate the dead when they've passed on, was really important to Victorian culture. So in under Queen Victoria in the British kind of um, like what's it called Great Britain. I don't know why I forgot the name of my own country there. Um, yeah, Victorians, they took it very seriously. Like if someone died, you are supposed to wear black and you never have fun and so on. Queen Victoria's own husband died and she just wore black for the rest of her life, which was like 40 years extra. Whereas in Italy, Renaissance Italy, it's not, you don't need to, you know, mourn that level. So it would be really shocking for Victorians because they're like, well, he's not even mourning. He's just moved on straight away and he's marrying someone else. So it's even extra frightening from that point of view. So there's tons more I could do on context, but I just, I want to try this to around 30 minutes just to not like stress you. Um, so hopefully you find this poem a lot more interesting. Hopefully I've like said stuff that kind of clicks with you and you feel like you've got a handle on it. As a final thing, I'd like you to just go through this list of themes that we have here and think about what is the poem's message on these themes. So what is it trying to say about psychology or jealousy or control? What kind of quotes relate to these? All of your exam questions, regardless of what exam board you're doing, will always be centered around either a character or a theme in poetry. So paying loads of attention to themes is a really good way to kind of mini plan potential essays that you might be given. So yeah, hopefully you like my last Duchess now and uh, you enjoyed listening to the ideas of it in a bit more depth. Thank you very much for listening and I'm sure I'll see you guys soon on another poetry lesson. Bye for now.